And this morning, I want to ask you a question. The question is this. What's the truth about you? What's the truth about you? You know, we're, we're here at New Hope Church and College, and I wanted to start with something a little fun. It's called an exegetical Greek study. Are you ready? So we're going we're gonna to do that this morning. And, you know, it's funny because I'm Greek, right? And so I figured what better way than to, to you know, get back to my roots and, and start with um, a Greek study. So I'm going to use something really cool and neat. And let me see if I can get it to work because it's fun. Nope, that's the wrong one. All right, here it is. So let's all read this together at the top of the board. <laughs> Ready, get set, go. Sui Simon o Ios Ioannu su Kelethese Kefas o Ermenuete Petros. How'd you do? I know, I, I, that was a little show off. But I'll translate it for you. It says, you are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Kephas or Cephas, which is translated Peter. Now, we, we can take a few things from this. This is, he's talking to Simon, and he's the son of John, but his name is going to be changed to Kephas or Cephas, and then uh, it's translated into Peter. Okay, so it's Simon... Son of John. Son of John. Okay, that's our first step. So what, what, what can we do with this? Well, it's a little wordy. It's kind of hard to read. So uh, let's change it to Simon John's son. Is that a little better? Uh, do you guys think that's a good translation? But what did he change his name to? Peter. Okay, so, or Kephas, which, which actually is translated rock. So let's, let's name him Peter, John's son. All right, that's a little better. But, you know, there's actually a shorter reading of this that we can do because we're trying to save some paper, right? So we want to get it a little smaller. So what's another way we could say this? Peter Johnson. Now, are you seeing it yet? <laughs> do, do you see it? Do you smell what the rock is cooking? <laughs> the rock Johnson. <laughs> I think we have a photo of him. Look, he's got the fish hook and everything. That's, that's what Peter looks like, I think. But now we know the, the truth about Peter, right? This is just a joke. But let's read it in, uh, in, uh, in our first... Uh, Notes right at the top of your screen. It says this in Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Ready? Get set. Go. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. And that's where we want to start this morning. What's the truth about you? Well, just like the song this morning, there are lies that we've placed on ourselves. But you know what's even harder to deal with than lies that we've placed on ourselves? Lies that aren't entirely a lie. But do you know what's even more difficult? Are those things that are actually true about us, but they don't really define us at our core. And that's what I mean by what's the truth about you? Who are you at your innermost core? What is your identity at its foundation? You know, the, the truth about me, I do fail. This is, these are some things that I, that I say to myself. I do fail. I am fat. I'm not as jacked as The Rock Johnson. Oh, <laughs> You guys laughed. Okay. My voice is really high. And, and so much so that seven out of ten times when I go to the drive-thru, the person says, is that all, ma'am? <laughs> and then I'll make my voice as low as I can. And they'll still keep calling me ma'am. <laughs> and you know, these, these are things, you know, people might be watching online and they weren't watching the screen and they're thinking, that's a guy speaking? Yes, I'm a guy. <laughs> but these are things that we can take and we can start defining our identity by them because they're, they're true events that happen. But that's not who we are. You know, these issues that arise, they're not the base core of our identity. And so I, I want to ask you again, what's the truth about you? You know, the philosopher Descartes, he once says, 
I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore I am. Well, I want to add to that this morning. I think, therefore I am, therefore I do. And what I mean by that is who we think we are or how we think about ourselves actually affects every aspect of what we do with our life. Think about it. The way you think about yourself is how you live out your life. And so that's why I wanted to start with Matthew 3, because this is a pinnacle moment for Jesus. And if you have your Bibles, you can actually turn to the end of Matthew chapter 3. And that's where the story is, that Jesus got baptized. And then as he came out of the water, a voice said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then in uh, continuing in chapter 4, it says this, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Say, he was hungry. He was hungry. hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, I want to give us a few things. This, the tempter that it's referring to, he's Satan. This is Satan. And, and Jesus was hungry. Say he was hungry. He was hungry. So he, he went for 40 days without food or water. I mean, I don't think I can go 40 minutes without something to eat. Why do you think I'm so jacked like The Rock Johnson? But he, he, was, he was starving. And, and I want us to take a closer look at this temptation because what do you think the first temptation was about? And you might be thinking, Chris, it's obvious. It's about food. It's about hunger. But is it really? Let's read it again. What does it say? The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Did you catch it? If you are the Son of God. See, the first temptation wasn't on Jesus' hunger. It was on his identity. The tempter was saying, Hey, You say you're the son of God. Are you really the son of God? Prove it. You think you're the son of God. Prove it. He was asking Jesus to prove who he was. And this brings us to our first point. The truth about you is you're a child of God. That's the truth about you. You're a child of God. Let's read this together in Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. You are a child of God. That's what this verse is saying. Well, years ago, I went with Christina uh, to the bank because she wanted to apply for her first credit card. And so I was like, yeah, I'll go with you. We were friends at the time. I was friend zoned, really. (laughs) We were friends. And so I went with her and and, uh, she went in, she applied, and then the teller came back and said, oh, we, we can't give you a card. And she's like, why? Uh, this is my f- first credit card. And they're like, I'll be right back. And then they come back with a stack like this thick of papers. And it was her credit report. Her identity was stolen at birth from the hospital. Wow. And somehow, she had already filed bankruptcy three times. <laughs> True story. And... And then what she found out in that moment was someone stole her identity and she had to work to get it back. You know, it's funny because a lot of us go through life this way. We're at birth. Our identity was stolen because of the consequences of sin. But what Jesus wants to do is restore our identity this morning. Can you say amen to that? See, Jesus wants you to know you are a child of God. Going back to the temptation with Jesus, the tempter was Satan. And you know, Satan is actually indicative of what he does. That, that word Satan, it actually means accuser. It means accuser. So Satan was accusing Jesus of being a fraud. 
He was accusing him of being a fraud. And he, his tactics are the same. You know, just like the sketch, he's going to accuse you of being a fraud. You're, are you really a son of God? Are you really a daughter of God? Are you really God's child? He's going to get you to doubt things in your own life because, you know, he has no authority to take your identity. So instead what he does is he gets you to question your own identity. And wh why is that? It's, well, it's, often it's because we take these things that are fickle and, and then they're, they're frail. And we say, this is what I'll build my identity on. The things that I do, the things that I work at, the things that I believe that are, are, are valuable, like my family, my, my, my job. Hey, those are very valuable things. But take those away and do you still have an identity? You know, it's, it's a hard question to ask because if I asked you, hey, who are you? Often we, we start talking about what we do and then we start talking about our family and our friends and, and then we talk about the things we believe about. These are, these are good things to talk about, but are they the truth about you? So um, yesterday I looked at the back of my MacBook, you know, my Apple MacBook, and, and it said something funny. It says, designed by Apple in California, assembled in China. I was like, that's so funny, that's just like us. Designed by God in heaven, assembled on earth. See, that's the stamp that's on your life, that's the stamp that's on my life, that we were designed by God in heaven. And we might be here on earth, but hey, we have a design that was given to us by our heavenly Father. And, and I want to read out of Jeremiah 1.5. It says this. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. See, this means that our identity, it's not figured out. It's formed intentionally by God. You know, when we're talking about identity, we have to go back to the beginning. We have to go back to Genesis 1. And in Genesis 1, it's the creation account, how God made all the things that we see around us, the earth, the heavens, and people, the animals. But there's something unique about when he makes mankind, when he makes man and woman. He puts what's called the imago Dei, which is a Latin translation for image of God. So he puts his own image on people. And it's unique from all of, uh, all of other creation because they don't get that distinction. And so, you know, we can't be 100% sure on exactly what the image of God is, but we know that it's, it's divinely and uniquely impressed upon us. So if we're talking about identity, we actually have to start here. Because what this means is, is every single person is uniquely and wonderfully made by a creative God. And it reminds me of a story about a little girl who once asked her mom, hey, mom, where do people come from? So her mom said, hey, you know, I know the answer to this. God created Adam and Eve, and from there they had children, and that's where all the people came from. So then the girl thought, okay, that's cool. A few days later, she went up to her dad, asked the same question. Hey, dad, where do people come from? And without a beat, he said, Millions of years ago, they were monkeys, and they evolved into people, and that's where people come from. So the girl was really confused. So then she went back to the mom. She said, hey, mom, you told me that God created us, but dad said that we evolved from monkeys. And the mom was so smart. She said, honey, it's so simple. Let me explain it to you. I told you where my side of the family came from. <laughs> Your father told you where his side came from. <laughs> the image of God. See, we can be uh, sure of a few things about the image of God. What it means is it's present in all people at all times. All people at all times. It's critical. God placed it only in humans. It's critical for who we are, both male and female. And God wants us to know about it. And you know, that's why here at New Hope, what we say is Christian and non-Christian alike are valuable to God and to his kingdom. 
Hey, you might not be, yet be a follower of Jesus. Hey, that's okay, because this morning I want to give you an opportunity at the end of the sermon. But Christian and non-Christian alike, you are valuable to God and to his kingdom. And it's, and it's inherent within the image of God. So for Jesus, his identity was secure. He knew who he was because he knew whose he was. We don't invent our identity. As children of God, we inherit our identity. We don't invent it. So the simple fact is this. My heavenly father created me, he formed me, and he loves me. And that should be enough to be the foundation of my identity. And so I found that, you know, if you don't fully understand something about the, in the Bible, if you read the verses before and after, it kind of gives some clarity about it. And so I, I went back to the, the temptation of Jesus. I was like, where did he get the security? Where did he know who he was? Well, it, it's, it's indicative in Matthew 3.16. It says this, And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This brings us to our second point. The truth about you, you're loved. The truth about you is you're loved. You are loved. See, Jesus' identity, it was already affirmed by the Father. He could easily say, I'm the Father's son and my Father loves me. I don't need that bread because I don't need to prove who I am because I know who I am. How do we know we're worth something? How do, how do we as people usually define that? On Friday when the paycheck comes in, when you hear someone say, hey, good job or well done, or by the things that we have, by the people and relationships that we have, are those the things that, that make us feel valuable and, and worth something? However, you know, this, this pericope, this story is right before Jesus started his earthly ministry. So in this moment when the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, he hadn't even done anything yet. That is so foreign in our culture. He's already pleased with him, but he didn't do anything? Like, come on, what, what, if, what, what do you think of when you, when you think about God thinking about you? That's a fun question to ask. Isn't yeah. it? How do you think God thinks about you? What, does, he, does he think, ooh, that guy, ooh, ooh? Or do you think he's pleased with you? You know, what if the words Jesus heard from, from after coming out of the water were, you're my son, I'm pleased with you so far, so don't mess it up. <laughs> that would have really changed. That would have rocked him to his core, I think. And, you know, it's actually not that shocking to imagine in our culture, in our context, because we usually seek affirmation based on a job well done, right? And many of us, myself included, we, we actually think either consciously or subconsciously, I have to earn the Father's love. I have to earn love. But that's not what the Bible says. You are loved. You didn't do anything to earn it. You're loved. And, and what's, there's a guarantee that actually is given to us. And it says this in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 21 through 22. We'll read it together. It'll be on the board. Ready? Get set. Go. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Well, what is this guarantee? Well, it's God's spirit that acts as our guarantee. The promises, all your promises are yes and amen. We just sang that this morning. Hey, the promises that are not yet realized, they're guaranteed because God's spirit guarantees them. And it says this in Romans 8, 16, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. See, God's spirit within our hearts is our guarantee. If you ever have moments that cause you to wrestle with, with your identity in Christ or, or some other identity issue, you can be confident in saying, I'm the Father's child, and the Father loves me, and his spirit lives in me. Just like Simon Peter, God wants to give you a new identity. But really, it's not a new identity. It's the one he had for you all along. 
And I want us to read out of Matthew 16, 16 through 17. It says this, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, you are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. He, after this, he then goes on to name Simon Peter. See, the significance of this moment, it can't be understated because when Simon Peter recognized who Jesus was, it allowed him to understand who he was. Do you get that? When Simon realized who Jesus was in his life, it allowed him to understand who he was. See, this is our last point. The truth about you can only be found in Christ. The truth about you can only be found in Christ because the truth is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, 6. See, the truth is Jesus. When you see Jesus as the per person of truth, you see the truth about you. When you see Jesus as the person of truth, you see the truth about you. Here it is. The truth about you is this. You're a child of God. You are loved dearly. And your life is made perfect in Christ Jesus. Not perfect because circumstances are perfect. Not perfect because you've done something perfectly no, perfect because of who Jesus is and who he has remade you into. It says this in Colossians 3, for you died and your life is now hidden in Christ in God. You see, when you, you come to Christ, you're given a new identity. You're given a new identity. You are hidden with Christ and you're a child of God and you're beloved of God, period. That's the truth about you. And and in Jesus, our identity is the same as Jesus's. It's I'm loved, I'm a child, and my Father is pleased with me. In Jesus, you are set free. In Jesus, you are redeemed. In Jesus, you have truth and understanding. In Jesus, you are made whole, complete, lacking in nothing. In Jesus, you are in the Father, and the Father is in you. You are in the Son, and the Son is in you. You are in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in you and affirms your identity. That's the truth about you. See, you don't have to earn the Father's love. You actually get to change the paradigm. You actually get to change the way you think about it. Before we would think, uh, I'm loved because I trust God. No, that's wrong. You're not loved because you trust God. Because you are loved, you trust God. I'm not loved because I trust God. Because I'm loved, I trust God. You see, every action about you stems from your core belief about you. And so as you think about who you are in Christ, you begin to change the way you live, not because it's a set of regimens and rules that you have to strictly live by. No, it's because you understand who you are. Hey, I, I don't want to act that way because I know I'm a beloved child of God. So it's not, it's not about a religion that, that gives you rules that dictate how you live. No, it's about a relationship. It's about a relationship that really opens up your eyes to see who you were designed to be from the very beginning. And that's what it means to be a child of God. And so this morning, you might be in this room, and you might not know what that feels like. You might not know what it means to truly understand who you are. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not perfect. I know, that's hard to think. I'm like, you look pretty perfect. I know, this haircut is really nice. A friend did it. I call this the straight and narrow. No, but... But the truth is, I'm not perfect. We're not perfect. But in Christ, we're seen as perfect by our Heavenly Father. And that's what it means to understand who you are at the core of you. The truth about you, you're a child of God. The truth about you, you're loved. And the truth about you is your life is made perfect in Christ. So this morning, if you don't know what that feels like, if you don't know what that means, can I encourage you? Hey, today's the day. 
Today's the day you might say, I don't know what it means to become a Christian, but I want to know what it means to have a firm identity. Because let me, let me ask you a question. Say you lost everything when you woke up tomorrow. And not just the proverbial everything. I mean everything. All your possessions, your mental capacity, your relationships, even your life. Do you still know who you are? Because we have a hope in Jesus that even if we die, we know who we are. Because I believe we're not destined for this world. We're destined for eternity. And so I know who I am. And yeah, I might struggle with with feeling a confidence from time to time. But at the end of the day, I know who I am because I know whose I am. And that's the question I want to ask you this morning. Do you know whose you are? And so let's all bow our heads right now. And if you're in this room right now and you haven't yet made, made a decision for Christ, today's the day. Today's the day that you get to, to get your new identity. But really, it's the one he originally designed for you from the beginning. Today's the day you get to feel loved, not because you've earned it, not because you've worked for it. No, but because you are already loved. And so what you're doing this morning, you're receiving the Father's love. And so if that's you in this room and you don't have to know everything there is to know about following Jesus, but today you get to start following Jesus. So if that's you, could you just raise a hand right now and say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to make you my Lord and Savior. Just go ahead and raise a hand boldly and say, that's me. I see that hand. Are there any others? I see that. And right now what you're saying is, Lord, I don't have it all together. But you don't have to have it all together. I see that hand. Lord, you see these hands, but most of all, you see these hearts. And right now, Lord, we ask that you would remint your image on these individuals, Lord, that you would say to them in this moment, you are my child. You are loved. You are dearly loved. And you're made perfect in my son, Jesus. Let's all stand together. We're going to pray a prayer together, and I'm going to give you the words, but can I encourage you? Let's add the heart. And this might be the first time you're praying this. It might be the hundredth time you're praying this. But let's pray it as if it's the first time with all of our heart. Lord Jesus, thank you that you came. And you died for my sins so that I might have life everlasting. Lord, change me and make me the person you want me to be. Lord, I turn from my sins and I turn to you. And now I say this so I can hear myself, so those around me can hear, so even the devil can hear. But Lord, most of all, you would know you are my Savior. My life belongs to you now and forever. Lord, that's the cry of our heart, that we would indeed turn to you with our entire being. Lord, we find our identity in you. We, we establish that you've made us and you've turned us into the most beautiful creation that you've ever made. And so right now, Lord, we ask right now that these people would feel a flood of your presence, that you will never leave us or forsake us. That's a promise. And we know it's a guarantee. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, amen. amen.